Hey, it's Brian, back with another Burr Month's bonus episode to bring a little extra Christmas cheer to those of us who get an early start on the Christmas season. Boy, the Burr Months sure do go by quickly. By the time you hear this, we'll already be about one-third of our way through the first month. I hope you're making the most of it. Here at Christmas Past Headquarters, I've already unpacked and dusted off my record player. I pull it out of storage every year to listen to the classic Christmas records I grew up with, and to the Christmas story records I've been collecting over the last several years. Speaking of stories, I figured I'd take a chance with this episode to bring you one that you might not have heard before. These classic and mostly forgotten Christmas stories are a vast, untapped goldmine of new ways to get into the spirit and to discover things that may go on to become new favorites. Today, we're going all the way back to 1896 and to a magazine called The Home Monthly. In the December issue, they published a new story by a writer named Elizabeth Seymour. But you and I know her better by her real name, Willa Cather. It's a simple and sweet story about a desperate crime committed on Christmas Eve that takes an unexpected turn. Now, just one little note. As is often the case in stories from this period, the original version of this story contains the use of a term that we don't use anymore because we recognize it as offensive. So in this reading, I changed that word to something a little more suitable. I'll come back at the end to wrap up and say goodbye. But for now, get comfy and join me for the 1896 story, The Burglar's Christmas. Two very shabby-looking young men stood at the corner of Prairie Avenue and 80th Street, looking despondently at the carriages that whirled by. It was Christmas Eve, and the streets were full of vehicles. Florist wagons, grocers' carts, and carriages. The streets were in that half-liquid, half-congealed condition peculiar to the streets of Chicago at that season of the year. The swift wheels that spun by sometimes threw the slush of mud and snow over the two young men who were talking on the corner. Well, remarked the elder of the two, I guess we're at our rope's end, sure enough. How do you feel? Pretty shaky. The wind's sharp tonight. If I had had anything to eat, I mightn't mind so much. There's simply no show. I'm sick of the whole business. Looks like there's nothing for it but the lake. Oh, nonsense. I thought you had more grit. Got anything left you can hawk? Nothing but my beard, and I'm afraid they wouldn't find it worth a pawn ticket, the younger man said ruefully, rubbing the week's worth of growth on his face. Got any folks anywhere? Now's your time to strike them, if you have. Never mind if I have. They're out of the question. Well, you'll be out of it before many hours if you don't make a move of some sort. A man's got to eat. See here, I'm going on a long tin saloon. I used to play banjo there with a couple of guys, and I'll bone him for some of his free lunch stuff. You'd better come along. Perhaps they'll fill an order or two. How far down is it? Well, it's clear downtown, of course, way down on Michigan Avenue. Thanks. I guess I'll loaf around here. I don't feel equal to the walk, and the cars, well, the cars are crowded. His features drew themselves into what might be a smile under happier circumstances. No, you never did like streetcars. You're too aristocratic. See here, Crawford, I don't like leaving you here. You ain't good company for yourself tonight. Crawford? Oh, yes, that's the one. There have been so many, I forgot them. Have you got a real name, then, anyway? Oh, yes, but it's also one of the ones I've forgotten. Don't you worry about me. You go along and get your free lunch. I think I had a row at Long Tin's place once. I'd better not show myself there again. As he spoke, the young man nodded and turned slowly up the avenue. He was miserable enough to want to be quite alone. Even the crowd that jostled by him annoyed him. He wanted to think about himself. He had avoided this final reckoning with himself for a year now. He had laughed it off and drunk it off. But now... When all those artificial devices were employed to turn our thoughts into other channels and shield us from ourselves had failed him, it must come. Hunger is a powerful incentive to introspection. It is a tragic hour, that hour when we are finally driven to reckon with ourselves, when every avenue of mental distraction has been cut off and our own life and all its ineffable failures closes about us like the walls of that old torture chamber of the Inquisition. Tonight, as this man stood stranded in the streets of this city, his hour came. It was not the first time he had been hungry and desperate and alone. 
but always before there had been some outlook, some chance ahead, some pleasure yet untasted that seemed worth the effort, some face that he fancied was, or would be, dear. But it was not so tonight. The unyielding conviction was upon him that he had failed in everything, had outlived everything. It had been near him for a long time, that pale specter. He had caught its shadow at the bottom of his glass many a time, at the head of his bed when he was sleepless at night, in the twilight shadows when some great sunset broke upon him. It had made his life hateful to him when he awoke in the morning before now. But now it settled slowly over him, like night, the endless northern lights that bid the sun a long farewell. It rose up before him like granite. From his brilliant city, with its glad bustle of yuletide, he had shut off as completely as though he were a creature of another species. His days seemed numbered and done, sealed over like little coral cells at the bottom of the sea. Involuntarily, he drew that cold air into his lungs slowly, as though he were tasting it for the last time. Yet he was but four and twenty, this man. He looked even younger, and he had a father someplace down east who had been very proud of him once. Well, he had taken his life into his own hands, and this was what he had made of it. That was all there was to be said. He could remember the hopeful things they used to say about him at college in the old days before he had cut away and begun to live by his wits, and he found courage to smile at them now. They had read him wrongly. He knew now that he never had the essentials of success, only the superficial agility that is often mistaken for it. He was toe without the tinder, and he had burnt himself out at other people's fires. He had helped other people to make it win, but he himself, he had never touched an enterprise that he had not failed eventually, or if it survived his connection with it, it left him behind. His last venture had been some ten-cent specialty company, a little lower than the others, that had gone to pieces in Buffalo, and he had worked his way to Chicago by boat. When the boat made up its crew for the outward voyage, he was dispensed with as usual. He was used to that. The reason for it? Oh, there were many reasons for failure. His was a very common one. As he stood there in the wet under the streetlight, he drew up his reckoning with the world and decided that it had treated him as well as he deserved. He had overdrawn his account once too often. There had been a day when he thought otherwise, when he had said that he was justly handled, that his failure was merely the lack of proper adjustment between himself and other men, that some day he would be recognized and it would all come right. But he knew better than that now. He was still man enough to bear no grudge against anyone, man or woman. Tonight was his birthday, too. There seemed something particularly amusing about that. He turned up a limp little coat collar to try to keep a little bit of the wet chill from his throat and instinctively began to remember all the birthday parties he used to have. He was so cold and empty that his mind seemed unable to grapple with any serious question. He kept thinking about gingerbread and frosted cakes like a child. He could remember the splendid birthday parties his mother used to give him when all the other little boys in the block came in their Sunday clothes and creaking shoes with their ears still red from their mother's towel and the pink and white birthday cake with the stuffed olives and all the dishes of which he had been particularly fond and how he would eat and eat and then go to bed and dream of Santa Claus. And in the morning he would awaken and eat again, until by night the family doctor arrived with his castor oil, and poor William used to dolefully say that it was altogether too much to have your birthday and Christmas all at once. He could remember, too, the royal birthday suppers he had given at college, and the stag dinners, and the toasts, and the music, and the good fellows who had wished him happiness and really meant it when they said it. And since then there were other birthday suppers that could not be remembered so clearly. The memory of them was heavy and flat like cigarette smoke that had been shut in a room all night, like champagne that had been a day opened, a song that had been sung too often, an acute sensation that has been overstrained. They seemed tawdry and garish, discordant to him now. He rather wished that he could forget them altogether. Whichever way his mind now turned, there was one thought that it could not escape, and that was the idea of food. He caught the scent of a cigar suddenly and felt a sharp pain in the pit of his abdomen and a sudden moisture in his mouth. 
His cold hands clenched angrily, and for a moment he felt that bitter hatred of wealth, of ease, of everything that is well-fed and well-housed that is common to starving men. At any rate, he had a right to eat. He had demanded great things from the world once, fame and wealth and admiration. Now it was simply bread, and he would have it. He looked about him quickly and felt the blood begin to stir in his veins. In all his straits, he had never stolen anything. His tastes were above it. But tonight, there would be no tomorrow. He was amused at the way in which the idea excited him. Was it possible that there was yet one more experience that would distract him, one more thing that had the power to excite his jaded interest? Good. He had failed at everything else, and now he would see what his chances would be as a common thief. It would be amusing to watch the beautiful consistency of his destiny work out even in that role. It would be interesting to add another study to his gallery of futile attempts and then label them all the failure as a journalist, the failure as a lecturer, the failure as a businessman, the failure as a thief, and so on, like the titles under the picture of the Dance of Death. It was time that Childa Roland came to the Dark Tower. A girl hastened by him with her arms full of packages. She walked quickly and nervously, keeping well within the shadow, as if she were not accustomed to carrying bundles and did not care to meet any of her friends. As she crossed the muddy street, she made an effort to lift her skirt a little, and as she did, so one of the packages slipped unnoticed from beneath her arm. He caught it up and overtook her. Excuse me, but I think you dropped something. She startled. Oh, yes, thank you. I would rather have lost anything than that. The young man turned angrily upon himself. The package must have contained something of value. Why had he not kept it? Was this the sort of thief he would make? He ground his teeth together. There is nothing more maddening than to have morally consented to crime and then the lack of nerve force to carry it out. A carriage drove up to the house before which he stood. Several richly dressed women alighted and went in. It was a new house and must have been built since he was in Chicago last. The front door was open, and he could see down the hallway and up the staircase. The servant had left the door and gone with the guests. The first floor was brilliantly lighted, but the windows upstairs were dark. It looked very easy just to slip upstairs to the darkened chambers where the jewels and trinkets of the fashionable occupants were kept. Still burning with impatience against himself, he entered quickly. Instinctively, he removed his mud-stained hat as he passed quickly and quietly up the stairs. It struck him as being a rather superfluous courtesy in a burglar, but he had done it before, he had thought. His way was clear enough. He met no one on the stairway or in the upper hall. The gas was lit in the upper hall. He passed the first chamber door through sheer cowardice. The second he entered quickly, thinking of something else lest his courage should fail him, and closed the door behind him. The light from the hall shone into the room through the transom. The apartment was furnished richly enough to justify his expectations. He went at once to the dressing case. A number of rings and small trinkets lay in a silver tray. These he put hastily into his pocket. He opened the upper drawer and found, as he expected, several leather cases. In the first he opened was a lady's watch. In the second, a pair of old-fashioned bracelets. He seemed to dimly remember having seen bracelets like them before, somewhere. The third case was heavier, the spring was much worn, and it opened easily. It held a cup of some kind. He held it up to the light, and then his strained nerves gave way, and he uttered a sharp exclamation. It was the silver mug he used to drink from when he was a little boy. The door opened, and a woman stood in the doorway facing him. She was a tall woman with white hair in an evening dress. The light from the hall streamed in upon him but she was not afraid. She stood looking at him a moment, and then she threw out her hand and went quickly toward him. Willie, Willie, is it you? He struggled to loose her arms from him, to keep her lips from his cheek. Mother, you must not. You do not understand. Oh my God, this is worst of all. Hunger, weakness, cold, shame, all came back to him and shook his self-control completely. Physically, he was too weak to stand a shock like this. Why could it not have been an ordinary discovery, arrest, the station house, and all the rest of it, anything but this? A hard, dry sob broke from him. 
Again, he strove to disengage himself. Who is it says I shall not kiss my son? Oh, my boy, we have waited so long for this. You have been so long in coming, even I almost gave up. Her lips upon his cheek burnt him like fire. He put his hand to his throat and spoke thickly and incoherently. You do not understand. I did not know that you were here. I came here to rob. It is the first time, I swear it, but I am a common thief. My pockets are full of your jewels. Can't you hear me? I am a common thief. Hush, my boy. Those are ugly words. How could you rob your own house? How could you take what is your own? They're all yours, my son, as wholly yours as my great love, and you can't doubt that, will you? That soft voice, the warmth and fragrance of her person stole through his chill, empty veins like a gentle stimulant. He felt as though all his strength were leaving him and even his consciousness. He held fast to her and bowed his head on her strong shoulder and groaned aloud. Oh, mother, life is hard, hard. She said nothing but held him closer, and oh, the strength of those white arms that held him, oh, the assurance of safety in that warm bosom that rose and fell under his cheek. For a moment they stood so silently. Then they heard a heavy step upon the stair. She led him to a chair and went out and closed the door. At the top of the staircase she met a tall, broad-shouldered man with iron-gray hair and a face alert and stern. Her eyes were shining and her cheeks were on fire. Her whole face was one expression of intense determination. James, it is William in here. Come home. You must keep him at any cost. If he goes this time, I go with him. Oh, James, be easy on him. He has suffered so. She broke from a command to an entreaty and laid her hand on his shoulder. He looked questioningly at her a moment and then went in the room and quietly shut the door. She stood leaning against the wall, clasping her temples in her hands and listening to the low, indistinct sound of the voices within. Her own lips moved silently. She waited a long time, scarcely breathing. At last the door opened and her husband came out. He stopped to say, in a shaken voice, You go to him now. He will stay. I will go to my room. I'll see him again in the morning. She put her arm around his neck. Oh, James, I thank you. I thank you. This is the night he came so long ago, you remember? I gave him to you then, and now you give him back to me. Don't, Helen, he muttered. He is my son. I have never forgotten that. I failed with him. I don't like to fail. It cuts my pride. Take him and make a man of him. He passed on down the hall. She flew into the room where the young son sat with his head bowed upon his knee. She dropped upon her knees beside him. Ah, it was so good to see him and to feel those arms again. He's so glad, Willie, so glad. He may not show it, but he is as happy as I. He never was demonstrative with either of us, you know. Oh, my God, he was good enough, groaned the man. I told him everything, and he was good enough. I don't see how either of you can look at me, speak to me, touch me. He shivered under her clasp again as when she had first touched him and tried weakly to throw her off. But she whispered softly, This is my right, son. Presently, when he was calmer, she rose. Now come with me into the library, and I will have your dinner brought there. As they went down the stairs, she remarked apologetically, I will not call Ellen tonight. She has a number of guests to attend to, but she's a big girl now, you know, and came out last winter. Besides, I want you all to myself tonight. When the dinner came, and it came very soon, he fell upon it savagely. As he ate, she told him all that had transpired during the years of his absence, and how his father's business had brought them there. I was glad when we came. I thought that you would drift west. I seemed a good deal nearer to you here. There was a gentle, unobtrusive sadness to her tone that was too soft for a reproach. Have you everything you want? It is a comfort to see you eat. He smiled grimly. It is certainly a comfort to me. I have not indulged in this frivolous habit for some thirty-five hours. She caught his hand and pressed it sharply, uttering a quick remonstrance. Don't say that. I know, but I can't hear you say it. It's too terrible. My boy, food has choked me many a time when I have thought of the possibility of that. 
Now, take the old lounging chair by the fire, and if you're too tired to talk, we'll just sit and rest together. He sank into the depths of the big leather chair with the lion's heads on the arms, where he had sat so often in the days when his feet did not touch the floor and he was half afraid of the grim monsters cut into the polished wood. The chair seemed to speak to him of things long forgotten. It was like the touch of an old familiar friend. He felt a sudden yearning tenderness for the happy little boy who had once sat there and dreamed of the big world so long ago. Alas, he had been dead many a summer, that little boy. He sat looking up at the magnificent woman beside him. He had almost forgotten how handsome she was, how lustrous and sad were the eyes that were set under that serene brow, how impetuous and wayward the mouth, even now, how superb the white throat and shoulders. Ah, the wit and grace and fineness of this woman. He remembered how proud he had been of her as a boy when she came to see him at school. Then, in the deep red coals of the grate, he saw the faces of the other women who had come since then into his vexed, disordered life. Laughing faces with eyes artificially bright, eyes without depth or meaning, features without the stamp of high sensibilities. And he had left this face for such as those. He sighed restlessly and laid his hand on hers. There seemed refuge and protection in the touch of her, as in the old days when he was afraid of the dark. He had been in the dark so long now, his confidence was so thoroughly shaken, and he was bitterly afraid of the night and of himself. Ah, mother, you make other things seem so false. You must feel that I owe you an explanation, but I can't make any even to myself. Ah, but here we make poor exchanges in life, and I can't make out the riddle of it all. Yet there are things that I ought to tell you before I accept your confidence like this. I'd rather you wouldn't, Will. Listen, between you and me, there can be no secrets. We are more alike than other people. Dear boy, I know all about it. I am a woman, and circumstances were different with me, but we are of one blood. I have lived all your life before you. You have never had an impulse that I have not known. You have never touched the brink that my feet have not trod. This is your birthday tonight. Twenty-four years ago, I foresaw all this. I was a young woman then, and I had hot battles of my own, and I felt your likeness to me. You were not like other babies. From the hour you were born, you were restless and discontented as I had been before you. You used to brace your strong little limbs against mine and try to throw me off as you do tonight. Tonight you have come back to me, just as you always did after you ran away to swim in the river that was forbidden to you, the river you loved because it was forbidden. You are tired and sleepy, just as you used to be then, only a little older and a little paler and a little more foolish. I never asked you where you had been then, nor will I now. You have come back to me, and that's all in all to me. I know your every possibility and limitation as a composer knows his instrument. He found no answer that was worthy to give to talk like this. He had not found life easy since he had lived by his wits. He had come to know poverty in close quarters. He had come to know what it was to be gay with an empty pocket, to wear violets in his buttonhole when he had not breakfasted, and all the hateful shams of the poverty of idleness. He had been a reporter on a big metropolitan daily where men grind out their brains on paper until they have not one idea left, and still grind on. He had worked in a real estate office where ignorant men were swindled. He had sung in a comic opera chorus and played Harris in an Uncle Tom's Cabin Company and edited a socialist weekly. He had been dogged by debt and hunger and grinding poverty until to sit here by a warm fire without concern as to how it would be paid for seemed unnatural. He looked up at her questioningly. I wonder if you know how much you pardon. Oh, my poor boy, much or little, what does it matter? Have you wandered so far and paid such a bitter price for knowledge and yet not learned that love has nothing to do with pardon or forgiveness, that it only loves and loves and loves? They have not taught you well, the women of your world. She leaned over and kissed him as no woman had kissed him since he left her. He drew a long sigh of rich content. 
The old life with all its bitterness and useless antagonism and flimsy sophistries, its brief delights that were always tinged with fear and distrust and unfaith, that whole miserable, futile, swindled world of Bohemia seemed immeasurably distant and far away, like a dream that is over and done. And as the chimes rang joyfully outside and sleep pressed heavily upon his eyelids, he wondered dimly if the author of this sad little riddle of ours were not able to solve it after all, and if the potter would not finally mete out all his comprehensive justice, such as none but he could have, to his things of clay which are made in his own patterns weak or strong for his own ends, and if some day we will not awaken to find that all evil is a dream, a mental distortion that will pass when the dawn shall break. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Bit of a prodigal son thing going on there. Speaking of sons, I've been wondering how much of my Burr Month's Christmas cheer to share with my 10-month-old. On the one hand, I want Christmas to be very special for him. On the other hand, he's too young to understand what's going on, and making him think that Christmas is something that happens for several months out of the year, rather than the more conventional season starting after Thanksgiving, might spoil things for him. Either way, I'm looking forward to spending my second Christmas with him. He was only a few weeks old last Christmas, and this year he'll be quite a bit more alert and engaged. Well, I'll be back in about another week with a new episode. Something different next time, but I'll keep it a secret for now. Until then, I'll remind you that Christmas Past is produced in wonderful Willow Glen, California, by yours truly, Brian Earle. And even though it's only September, it's never too early to send a Christmas memory to appear in an episode this season. I've already received the first one of the season, and maybe the next one will be from you. Just record a voice memo into your phone and send it to christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. Keep it reasonably short, clean and family friendly, and be sure to say your name and where you're from. And just yesterday morning, I mailed a Christmas card containing a Christmas past sticker to jolly old England. I'd be happy to send one to you too. If you review Christmas past on Apple Podcasts, I'll pop one in the mail for you any time of year. Reach out for details. Again, you can email me at christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com or message me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And speaking of Facebook, join our private Christmas Past Facebook group and celebrate with the rest of the family all season long. Until we meet again, may your days be merry and bright. <laughs>